How's it going everyone? Toaster Party here. Uh, this video is going to serve as a guide uh, that, that walks you through my workflow for how I make fan hacks for Metroid Prime. Um, I'm going to show you how to set up everything uh, and then I will walk you through a short example, um, like a single room fan hack uh, that makes use of some of the features, not everything, uh, just to kind of get an idea of, of that workflow and how it's used. Uh, as you watch this video, keep in mind that a text version of this guide, uh, including links to everything I'm using, can be found in the video description. Uh, but just a, a high level overview of, of what's going on here is um, I've kind of developed a, a like modding methodology um, that is fits somewhere in a middle ground between Planimizer and like a whole hog um, like edit with Prime World Editor. Uh, and so the, the benefits there, right, is that, for example, if you have, um, right, if, if you want to make a, a planimizer, like, layout, um, and what that means is it's basically randomizer, but a player, or that the, the creator is picking the locations of the items, um, that, that's great and all, um, and you can do that in Randovania by just opening a .rdv game. Uh, and basically editing, you know, for each location, what item goes where, and then for each elevator, where does it go? Um, so if that's all you, you're looking to do, I would actually recommend just using Renovania for that um, and, and just staying in that ecosystem. This guide is for people who want to do a little bit more. Um, I think most commonly, um, th this is probably the, the first and foremost use case, but... Uh, before this guide um, and then the tools that I've developed, kind of your only alternative, um, if you wanted to edit more um, than just the stuff provided by, by base randomizer, uh, you would have to use Prime World Editor, um, which is a very incredible, powerful tool. Uh, but the, the granularity of the control, control it provides um, is kind of too much for what most people want to do with it. Um, so for example, if I enter a room like main plaza you can see everything's here um, and every little detail and scripting detail um, that's used by the base game is here you know to be viewed and edit edited and modified uh, but the amount of information presented here uh, can be kind of overwhelming uh, and it's it's very slow um, so you can do pretty much anything with this uh, but Distributing mods is hard using something like Delta Patcher, um, and it only works for one version of Metroid Prime, or the one that you're using for the project, um, and, and a bunch of other limitations. So, uh, right, my middle ground uses the patcher for the randomizer, um, which is called Random Prime. Uh, and the API it exposes has a lot more control. Um, than simply just what Renovania's uh, RDV game format supplies. Um, but it's not so detailed um, that, that you kind of get lost in the sauce. So I make use of things like prefabs um, is, is a good word for it, to be able to you know set things like add a blast shield to a door but not have to worry about all the details uh, of how that works. So... Um, yeah, so to get started here, um, we're going to come to the Metroid Prime Fan Hacks repository that I maintain. Um, and you can read the, the main read me here, but the thing that we're most interested in here um, is this creator's guide. Um, so you can click this link here in the description, or it's just in this doc folder. So this creator's guide um, is kind of the text version of, of what I'm saying here. You should read through it all in its entirety. Um, but so for initial setup, you're going to want to create a folder. Um, so I have that here, I'm calling it my prime mod. You're going to need to grab the patcher, the latest patcher. So I have a link here, um, where the latest patcher can be found. So right now, four days ago, 1.18.12 was released. Um, you should always kind of monitor this to see what new features, fixes and stuff are coming out. Um, I always make it backwards compatible 
so you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, but if there's features that you see here that you need, you'll have to update your patcher. Um, right, so we just need to extract that and we'll add that to the mod folder. And then if we go back to the guide, it says we also need uh, some helper files. So we'll just grab those. Close those tabs. I'm just gonna drag them all over. And then the guide says that right here, this is uh, where the magic happens. This is a, a layout file. Um, so this defines the, the contents of the mod. So this is the template that I provide. We're gonna rename that to layout um, because it's no longer the template, it'll be ours. Uh, and then you can see we're, we're good to go. Um, so if we want to just see what this looks like, um, the, the template without any modifications, we can double click this patch.bat, and this is exactly what the end user experience will be like um, when you're distributing the fan hack. So if you double click that, we'll get a warning. If you click more info and run anyways, you can get around that. Um, and then it'll pop up to windows. So it'll say select your input ISO. So this input ISO can be any version of the game um, that ran on, on GameCube. So I have the original North American release here. I'm gonna open that up. Then you'll see it'll patch. And we can close that. So now in that folder, it's created my ROM hack.iso. So if I go ahead and load that into Dolphin by just dragging and dropping the ISO into that window, we can see that it's very vanilla like, um, but it has right some some major differences here. So one is there's a template message that's on the main menu that you can customize. I'm gonna erase the save um, and just make a new one here to speed ahead to see. Right, the the starting room is landing site instead of forget a couple of just standard changes um, that I think are gonna be most the most common way of using this. Um, and you can see here. Right, all, all item locations have been replaced with missiles, um, and there's some kind of quality of life changes um, that most people who are, have played a lot of randomizer will be used to. So like in the original North American release, uh, for example, your missile count isn't, you don't see the capacity, you just see the current missiles, so stuff like that. Um, right, the map is all um, already downloaded. You don't have to visit a map station, stuff like that, so. Uh, so we'll go ahead and close out of there. Let's see what next. So now we're we're ready to actually get in and start adding our own changes. So I recommend Visual Studio Code for making changes. Um, we can go ahead and launch that by right-clicking on our mod folder um, and opening Visual Studio Code. Um, so that brings us out here. You can see it's it's the same files as in Windows Explorer. It's just shown in, in this uh, text editor. Um, and the other thing we want to do here is go to View and bring out Problems, um, which will be important later. So um, the meat and potatoes here is the that layout file. So you can see, um, you know, for example, this is what determines the output file name. So if you're starting your own, there's a couple things that you'll want to change right away. The output ISO name, um, this result string, right? You can change this. This is shown at, at the end of the game um, on, on the final screen. The starting memo. Um, so if you want to display some expository text at the start when they create a new save file, that's what this is. Um, this is shown in Dolphin um, or on, on Nintendo um, or, or any other loader um, to the player just to, if they're inspecting the, the ISO. Here's that main menu message. So first line, second line. You can use um, in a lot of places backslash N to indicate a new line. Um, and then this is credits text, um, which you can edit. And then, of course, the artifact hints. 
Um, so all of those are just kind of left as, as like a default um, that you can go ahead and find and change um, just to, to not be gibberish in, in your version. Um, so this code editor, this is where you'll spend most of your time. So it's of the format of Random Prime's API. And the nice thing is that Random Prime provides a JSON schema, which is specified to this line here. Um, so if you're starting from scratch, right, and you don't want to use the template, you just want to start from, from an empty file, you would start with just an open JSON brace, right, this schema line, um, and then you're good to go. So if, if you have this line, now Visual Studio Code is smart enough to understand what each of the properties are. Um, so you can, anything you don't understand, you can mouse over and see that game breaking, right, fixes crashes, soft locks, et cetera, um, so that you know why you're setting true or false. Um, and it's also smart enough to know that, right, if I set this to a 10, that's neither true nor false. Um, so it'll squiggly underline it, which you can see the, the file name is yellow. There's yellow in the scroll bar. Um, and the problems tab, you can now uh, see a list of all the things you need to fix because this will throw an error if you try to patch this like this. Um, so that's why we need the problems window open. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with the example. Right, so let's say right, our starting room, we're starting in landing site. Let's say we'd rather start in Chozo Ruins. Right, so we can say Chozo Ruins. Um, and you can see as I type, it starts suggesting valid entries. Um, so it's underscored here saying Chozo Ruins in itself isn't a valid option. We need to select the specific room. So where do we, where do we want to spawn in Chozo Ruins? Let's say Ruins, a ruined entryway. Entrance? Ruins entrance. There we go. All right. Huge that it, it helps you with typos like that. Um, and then we'll go ahead and delete the starting memo. Uh, what else? And then if we want to right, modify what's in Ruins Entrance, this template has kind of a stubbed out version of every room in the game. Uh, so I just did Control F to find Ruins Entrance. Uh, you can see it doesn't have any pickups. Um, and the doors list is empty. So um, what I want to do is I want to place a charge beam pickup in this room, and I want to lock the door to main plaza with a, a charge beam lock. Um, so there's a couple things we'll need for that. Right, so here on the resources, we can see we need the annotated game maps. So we need to know what door number or what dock number um, is, is which. So you can see in Ruins Entrance, the door to main plaza is door number zero. The door to the elevator is door number one. Um, so now if I hit Control Space, you can see it'll let me pick. There's a maximum, the, the biggest room in the game only has six doors. Um, so you can see we have up to six doors to choose from. So first let's edit door number zero. You can see it's suggesting a new object. Um, and I, I should actually mention before digging too far into here, um, if you want to see right, all of the documentation all expanded all at once instead of having a mouse over or use it in the context of an editor, you need to come right to the resources and look at the random prime API. So this page is the same information um, that's enriching this experience here, um, but you can kind of read it. it it's a more readable format. Um, all right, so we're in right the level data key. You can see in level data, we're in Talon Overworld in the rooms key, right? So Talon Overworld, we're in the rooms. Oh, wait, no, that's, that's wrong, yeah. Chozo ruins, duh. 
in the rooms key and we're in runes entrance. So you can see here, right, we get all the way to here and if we're trying to figure out what format the data um, in rooms is, it's saying it's the same as exterior docking hanger. So this list here is mostly just helping you validate what valid world and room names are. For the actual content that goes in the room, it's all the same no matter what room it is. Um, so we just look at exterior docking hanger to, to reference the documentation for a single room. Excuse me. Um, so if we look at the doors, you can see, right, the key name is the dock number as described here. And then it has three properties um, per door. So it's a shield type, blast shield type, and destination. We won't get into destination, that's for, for room rando. That's a bit advanced. Uh, but you could see if I come into the code editor and I hit control space, you can see it's suggesting those same three things. Um, right, so the shield type, and I'm just hitting control space anytime, right, I want these lists to pop up. So the shield type is right, basically the door color. I'm gonna say it's a charge beam door. And the blast shield type, I also want it to be charge beam. Um, the way blast shields work in random prime is after the door's opened, it will default to a blue door. Um, or in the case of say like a wave buster door, it'll go back to a wave door. Um, so that's why I'm doing it this way. And let's say we don't want the player to backtrack to the elevator. I can just say the shield is disabled towards the elevator. Uh, and then to be able to open that door, of course, we need a, a charge beam. So if we look at right, the pickups array, we can go ahead and start adding a new pickup um, as defined between these two braces. So the type by default is nothing, but we can say it's a charge beam. Um, and if we read the documentation more and we're looking at pickups, it'll say, right, pickups, uh, pickups that aren't like beyond the count that are normally there in the vanilla room require position. So if Ruin's entrance in vanilla had a single pickup, this would all we, would be all we need to do to replace that pickup with charge beam. Since Ruin's entrance doesn't normally have a pickup, um, we need to specify the position, right? So that's simple. And just add a comma, hit control space again, and go, hmm, there's a lot of options here, but we want position. Um, position is always just an XYZ coordinate, but the question is, where do we put it? Um, so that's where Prime World Editor um, comes in handy. Um, basically, instead of using Prime World Editor to make edits, we're just using it as a resource um, to uh, basically learn about the game and visualize changes better. Um, since a lot of these text-based changes we have to use our imagination for, um, it helps to have something like a visual editor um, at hand. Right, so we're in main plaza is the wrong room, so we need to be in Ruins Entrance. Right, and let's say we want the charge beam to be behind this pillar, right? No one ever goes back here. So I want to know what position, what XYZ coordinate is here. The best way to do that is just to grab a nearby object, um, and you can see its position here. Uh, if you click and drag on these scroll wheels, you can kind of just slide objects around. So let's say about there. And so now this scan point is where I want to place that charge beam. So I'll go ahead and split these. And literally just copy paste the values. And now we can see our Changes are done for this charge beam related change. So uh, I think we're ready to test again. So we can go ahead and minimize this and this and this, and we'll go ahead and patch again. So it's going to just override this file again. You can see the date changed on it. Um, and we'll go ahead and drag that over. Uh, 
Um, what's important to note is every time you change the ISO, you edit it, you need to delete the save file and start over. I'm gonna fast forward here. Right, so you can see we can't go this way because there's a charge door. This prefab comes with you know everything you need, like a scan point um, that teaches the player um, what's needed for it. We can look, see on the mini map, right? This door is grayed out, meaning that it's been modified. Can't open it. Um, and then we can see our charge beams here. Right, so cool. Now we have access to main plaza and it's charge locked. So we'll, we'll proceed with making changes. So I'll bring back up the text editor. Uh, so what do we want to do now? So um, let's start making changes to main plaza. Now that we're in that room. Um, I'm always going to say no to saving changes because I want to use Prime World Editor as a basically a viewing port um, into the vanilla game only. So making sure to always say no there. All right? Let's let's spice things up a little bit. Um, I want to block off the entire this entire half of Main Plaza from the player. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to place a big wall here right at um, the edge of the half pipe. Um, so since this is a wall is something that has size and position, I'm going to use the nearest trigger, right? It's these blue checkered boxes. Anything, anyone will work. And I'm just going to borrow that for, for visualizing the change, right? So we'll use this one. Um, and if we come over to the edit script button, um, we can start looking at the trigger and we can see that triggers have position and scale, which is what we want. So the same way that I was dragging position around down here, I'm going to mess with the scale. Um, so I want it to be a thin wall. I don't want it to be as thick as this trigger is normally. It's a little too thin. Um, and we can say, ah, eh, just one is fine. We want to drag it back over and say, say there's fine. Maybe we can make it a little taller. Oops. All right, that's that's a nice little wall. I'll push it back a little again. Uh, and perfect. So now that we have that, I'm just going to expand this so we can see this easily. Push it over. Uh, right, so we're in main plaza now. So, right. Main plaza has pickups, has doors. I'm just going to hide these so I can focus on what matters to me. Um, so I also want to add a block, right? Blocks are kind of what, what walls are called. Um, so what's required for a block? Um, it can have position, scale, and texture. Um, and you can see the problems is complaining that we don't have position, we don't have scale. So texture will default to something. Um, but position and scale will throw an error if we don't add those. So let's start with position. Oops. I accidentally scrolled. Uh, and we're going to grab the position from here this time. Scale. Um, for whatever reason, in this version, the scale of the block will be slightly different than what the trigger shows in PWE. Um, so you might need to kind of play test with it a little bit in-game. Um, and then I also want to add a texture, right? So I can see my options. So it's default in grass. We'd rather have it be sandstone to fit in with main plaza. Um, and while we're at it, let's keep adding changes. Let's keep going. Right, so let's show 
let's say we want to do something with this tree, right? So heck, let's add a, a platform in here. So platform's a little different than a than a wall. Um so we'll just say also we'll have platforms. All right, if you want to add multiple blocks, you just add a comma here, control space. Now you're adding a second block. Um, but we're adding a new platform. Um, and we only care about its position. So let's say like around here. I'm going to use some values that I know work well. Five. Um, and then, right, this platform is going to help the player to get to the tree. Let's say we don't want this cap here. We're, we're not interested in having the mechanic of destroying it with super missiles to be interesting. So this is the first time that instance ID is useful. Um, instance IDs are just shown up here at the top whenever you click on something. Right, so this point of interest has this ID. This tree knot has this ID. And this, is, this ID is always in hexadecimal as shown in Primal Editor. Um, but this layout file always takes things in decimal format. So there's converters for this online. I just use Python because it's fast. But all I'm doing here is converting this hexadecimal number to a decimal number. Um, and since I want to delete that, I'll say, looks like delete IDs is the thing I want. Right again, if you're not sure what something is, just mouse over it. And you can see that we will now ask the patcher to remove this object from this room. Beautiful. Um, so let's go ahead and test this change. Um, but instead of using the patch, right, let's save a little bit of time and let's use the quick play um, patch option. So we're going to have the same error since the first time we're running it. It patches the exact same way. Um, but the difference is here, it's not copying any music files over, so it's going to save space, and this is going to patch and transfer a little faster. Um, and when I throw this into Dolphin, uh, the difference is, right, it's not going to take us to the title screen. We don't have to delete um, the old save file anymore. It's just going to drop us straight into the starting room. Um, and this is just a good way to uh, test our changes here. The one downside is you're stuck with all the default settings, including hints. Um, and then I also made it so that you start with all items uh, just to make testing easier. Right, so you can see cutscene shows our, our big giant wall. It's a little bit bigger um, than, than what we saw in Prime World Editor. Um, but now, of course, I can't go this way. So we've changed the room significantly. And let's say, you know, how does the player get up here now to progress? Let's say they do something silly. Um, maybe it's a little jumping puzzle like, like this or something. All right, cool. So now you've, you've pretty substantially modified how this room works, uh, which is, which is cool. Um, so let's go even further. I'll show some a little bit more uh, advanced changes. Um, but you can see that right with what I've shown you already, you can do a lot uh, and, and really change you know, how, how the player thinks about the game. Let's see, so um, we're going to get into scripting a little bit. Um, so Right. Everything we've done thus far, you can do with a pretty basic understanding of the game and how it works. Um, but if you are one of those people that you know knows how retro scripting engine works inside and out, um, you'll find right, these kinds of changes really intuitive. Right. So I'm gonna. I'm interested in. I'm just gonna drag this out of the way so we can see this missile. Let's say for whatever reason, I want it so that when the player picks up this missile, they get teleported. So the first step there would be to right, make a spawn point, just 
anywhere that we want to move the player to. Let's say we want to move them up here, right? This is a this isn't a spawn point, but we can use its position anyways. So I'm gonna kind of speed things up here a little bit. Let's say spawn points, add one, Let's say its position, steal that from this. Right, and then I want to give it an ID. Um, and I'm fine with the defaults of the rest. For the an ID, this is just the instance ID. Bigger numbers are better, um, just because they're less likely to collide and cause problems. Um, but you can't reuse IDs, is, is the important thing. They're a unique way of referencing an object in its room. Um, right, and then I want to add a connection. Right, so I want to add a scripting connection um, the target's going to be our spawn point. The message is going to be set to zero, um, which basically means uh, respawn there. Um, and the way you learn these things is you look in Prime World Editor and you say, okay, this is a spawn point. Right? I know that this is a spawn point. It says spawn point. And we know how it works. You watch the cutscene and you end up here. So how does the game send the player to the spawn point? Um, well, when you start the cinema, it sends a set to zero message to the spawn point. So we can intuit that setting a spawn point to zero means reposition, and we just have to remember that. Um, and you kind of build up pieces of knowledge bit by bit about how the game works and what all the scripting messages mean. Um, they can be a little bit cryptic at times, but you always just work by example because you have a working game engine with a game in front of you. So um, so what's sending that message, for example? Well, let's look at this pickup. Um, we could use the pickup on arrived, um, but let's go ahead and use this post pickup relay. Um, right, relays are just ways to extend scripting. So we're going to look, uh, convert this relay ID to decimal. Sender ID is this relay. And then we can see relays, when they reach the zero state, they send their message. So we'll use the zero state to send our message. Um, and then we'll go ahead and try that out. This time, when I pick my ISO, um, and first off, make sure you're always saving, right? Because if you don't save, then when you patch, you're not using, you're, you're patching something old, and that can get confusing. So we get in the habit of saving frequently. Um, instead of using the base game, the vanilla game, I'm going to use the old Prime Practice mod. So this is the one um, without all the fancy GUI, without the bomb timer, a reset timer graph. Um, it's it's the old one from a few years ago, and that's my input ISO. It works just the same except I can edit my inventory when I'm in the game. So I'll patch that, close it when it's happy, drag, fast forward, good old garbled text from the old practice mod. I like to hide these things because the game does lag without these. Come through here, I'm just gonna use space jump since we verified our little Platforming puzzle works fine. Right, grab the missile, responds me to the side. Um, so I hope, right, that gave you a good taste um, on how to uh, accomplish right things with this methodology. It's not everything, um, and this patcher can't do everything you would want to do. Um, I'm working on expanding its functionality. So do keep checking the Pi Random Prime, Pi Random Prime releases page um, for additional features um, and fixes. The schema documentation site, that'll update automatically, and so will your, your text editor. Um, we'll start looking for those new features automatically. The only thing you have to do is if you see an update, you have to replace that exe. 
Um, so I thank you a lot. If you've watched this far and you are this interested in this work, um, I, I know this was a little bit rambly, uh, but I, I look forward to seeing those brave souls who do get into the weeds at this and, and learn something new and try to make something cool for the community. So, um, toaster out.